and see you. Okay. All right. Well, let's worry about the slides for now. How's that sound? There you we'll go. address the other. So here we go. Yes. Uh, again, I appreciate what you have uh, taken time for. And I, as I stop and think about humus, and we talked about humus yesterday, but the benefits of humus and how that improves soil fertility. This is some of the things that I think many, many people miss. The bigger picture of, yeah, everybody recognizes photosynthesis, but what does it really do? And why does this all matter to soil fertility? I'd like to just go through a few things. It expands the soil. And I'd like to note that that humus is not microbes. Humus is actually a protein. It is a product of microbes growing the protein. Humus is a active substance. It is not a live substance, and that's powerful. If you depend strictly on microbes and not their byproducts, you will fail. That is my experience. We've had our 30th anniversary just last month on the 17th. And I have been around the block. Before that time, I had seven and a half years worth of training in renewable soil science. And I would like to just make this comment that I am absolutely an adamant advocate of micro life in the soil. Don't take this differently than that. But I'm also keenly aware if it wasn't for their byproducts, microbes wouldn't matter. Does that make sense? Yeah. And so I need it, but I need also the effect of them. It's about economics, not just making this a fun story. <clears throat> humus balances soil chemistry. <clears throat> humus balances soil chemistry by and of itself automatically by sequestering or capturing some of the excesses. One of our biggest issues that we have found through the last 30 years is that high nutrients are one of the things keeping low nutrients from coming in the plant. It is the excesses that concern us by far more than the deficiencies, even though we recognize the deficiencies need to, ha to be resolved. But if there's X space and the excesses are taking that, and we are learning how to take that excess of nutrients down, that creates more space for the deficiency to come in and no longer be deficient. Does that make sense? Yes. Yeah. So we're dealing with it from that perspective. Humus soil builds soil biology. We look at a micro system, micro life system, whether it's a fungus or a micro bacteria, either one single cell organisms like these do not have babies, nor do they lay eggs. They've got to multiply by taking in enough energy to expand to the point where they de develop a visual wall in the center and develop two nuclei in the, in the outside two parts and eventually separate and become two microbes versus one. Those two do the same and those four do the same and those eight do the same, etc. So for us, it is all about how can we expand microlife to the needed amount. We can't possibly deliver the amount of microbes we need to make the job. We are totally dependent on it expanding its numbers once it gets out there. And so what we want is something that expands numbers because we can't possibly. Let me give you an example. I, I don't have this in this presentation, but in our soils classes, I go through this methodically. We're talking about looking at a target number of around 200 little critters per colony forming unit per gram of soil. 454 grams of, of, uh, in a pound going to 2 million pounds in a soil makes that number in the sextillion month moments, which is approximately 17 zeros. And all I'm saying that for is, is you've got to have microbes expand. There's no way that you want to put a thousand gallons of extract on per acre to deliver the same amount, right? Right. Or I, I should not say 1,000. I think it's actually closer to 10. I'll have to do the calculations again, but it is around 1,000 tons. 
And, and so we can't put that out there. That's not economical. We have got to manage microbes from a distance. We have to manage the environment to get the things to happen that we want to see happen. So that's, that's why that's the case. The next bullet point is we want to put the plant in charge. That ultimately is our final goal. We're looking at the interactions of the soil uh, tip, the uh, root tips, but it's because of how we're trying to harvest more sun. I'll get into that more later. Humus creates a soil environment that allows the plants and microlife both to thrive. <clears throat> Weedy fields and low yields obviously are an embarrassment to the community. It's sickening, embarrassing, or just and just plain discouraging. I, I've been there. I know what I'm talking about. We've got to learn about how to deal with this. And interestingly enough, both of these pictures are out of one of uh, each one of them in a different part of our field. The bottom one, we cut away a sand hill. You can tell that some of it is coming back. Uh, we added humus on it. Today, you can't hardly see anything that was cut away anymore. In the top, this was in the second year that we farmed this from conventional, still in transition. And so, yeah, we had some weeds get away from us in the beginning. And yet, I just bring this up as an example that saying, okay, the commonality out among all of agriculture, whether it's in Australia, like I just presented a few weeks ago, or whether it's in Ecuador or Peru or Colombia or here in the U.S., we still have this commonality. We got nature to work with, right? Are you maximizing the sun's energy? This is a big deal. How humus solutions work. Build, pronounced humus, not hummus. Plants use calories from sun energy in order to grow. I could read all of that, but what we're dealing with is talking about kilocalories, which is a thousand kilocalorie units. This sun energy is where you're at. And, and I have an example coming up. The humus proteins stimulate root tip growth, which stimulates more photosynthesis that causes the plant to utilize more kilocalories of sun energy more than any other compost. The average amount of sun energy that shines on each square meter in the U.S. is around 1.6 million kilocalories of energy. The average farmer utilizes three to 4,000. We've been able to document over 9,000 capturing. And that's obviously threefold. Here's the experiment I was talking about yesterday. <clears throat> After five years, he discovered this tree weighed exactly 150, 64 pounds instead of five pounds like it started. That's a net gain of 159 pounds. And when you think about what that's all about is you're, you're talking about a massive grain, uh, gain there, and that's all just putting on water, okay? And if you look at it, you start thinking about that, the soil had 199 pounds and 14 ounces left, meaning it only took two ounces. Let's think about this. So the sun energy utilized from previous crops is coming from the bulk of it is coming from the sun energy called photosynthesis process or photosynthate. And so here we go. We got 159 pound gain, 16 ounces to a pound is 2,500 and 44 ounces. Only two ounces came from the soil. None of the gain came from fertilizer. That means 2,542 ounces are coming from a process called photosynthate. Now let me just talk about that. The combination of these four materials coming together, producing a simple glucose from the photosynthesis process is called photosynthate. Sun rays, atmospheric air, water, and CO2. You stop and think about it, I will back up just a moment. That 2,542 ounces that I have right here, that's all coming from those four things I have on this slide. Guys, what's interesting is, is stop and think about it. How heavy is sun rays? It's negligible weight. We don't know that it has a weight. It's very, very light. As a matter of fact, there's proof today, sun rays will penetrate the invisible 
sun rays will penetrate the soil down to 300 feet deep. How do I know that? There's been a study done, and it's it's also this study is written up in a book by a guy named Dr. Arn Anderson. Wrote a book about um, oh I can't say the book's name right now. I'm just pausing. But anyway, that book has got this story in there. They take a praying mantis plant. You know what that is? During the night, the leaves are pretty much vertical. And then during the day, as the sun shines, they come out and be more horizontal. Until they got to 300 foot down in a coal mine shaft that goes that went horizontal into a mountain, they got to 300 foot under the ground, it no longer reacted. 200 feet, it still did slightly. 250, it occasionally did. 300 feet, it doesn't do it anymore. And what I'm trying to help you understand is the sun rays are very, very light. Atmospheric air is the same as the air, weight-wise. Water in a steam or a vapor is lighter than air. Steam goes up, as you know. CO2 is twice as heavy as air. Why am I methodically doing this for you? All three of, all four of these things. The reason is, this is a net average weight of the four is five to six times lighter than atmospheric air. Guess what? We're going to go back one slide one more time, and we're going to talk about this. 2,542 ounces when it goes in a compost pile. Do you guys think this being largely made up of those four things, five times lighter than air, do you guys think that it is a necessary scenario if you want to capture last year's sun that you better think about how you capture that and don't allow it to evaporate? Is that a fair statement? Yeah. From my, pers for, from my perspective, it's very, very critical. Get that. When I talk about humus, it's all surrounding this principle. <laughs> Compare that to helium gas and a helium gas balloon being approximately three times lighter than atmospheric air. You put, we all know, you put these balloons together with helium gas and the children like it and the older children like us like it and the balloons go up in the air, don't they? So if that can make a balloon go up, but it's not as light as this stuff that you're rotting down. If you want last year's sun into this year's crop, you're not doing it unless you're actively capturing this. Regular compost cycle doesn't do it. I'm telling you, I know this. I've done this for 30 years. The point here is that he, just as helium gas wants to evaporate and go up in the air, so it does photosynthate material during the compost process. When the organic cell decomposes slash opens up, and allows it to escape up in the air. Aeromaster humus captures the photosynthate material as it's escaping, but doesn't allow it to evaporate. And it actually, we, we do two things. We, we put in a clay, clay soil, and we put in a product called the N converter, which is nutrient conversion. And that <clears throat> microbe stimulated by the decaying organic matter puts out an enzyme that is a negative ionic charge to it. And all of this stuff escaping wants to cling to that. And it cuts the VOCs, volatile oxidizing compounds. Or it cuts and grabs onto the stuff that likes to evaporate. Remember the 2,542 ounces. We're capturing it. That's not humus yet. But then we put a different microbe in the compost that then turns that protein that into a protein called humus protein. It is a several step process. Actually, we have a third inoculant that then also makes it a stronger protein. Nonetheless, our microbe packages, our inoculants are not to make it compost. They are to make it more valuable. How? By capturing it, by converting it to a protein and by making the protein stronger. One, two, three. I've, I've uh, done this for many years. I do not say this to boast. I do not say this to pat myself on the back. I do this to say I've made all the mistakes I think it can be made. It's, it's probably not quite true, but it's really, we have been around the block. 
We have equipment in 31 countries. This is one of our pieces of equipment we manufacture. But we have equipment in 31 countries. We have been in most of those countries, uh, I, either myself or one of our team members. I've only been to 13 of them. But anyhow, composting is a microbial process. All organic matter contains lighter than air materials coming from photosynthesis. These materials are normally lost unless they're captured. All the ingredients need to be properly selected and processed for a synchronized, that fancy word synchronized means a uniform breakdown process. Okay, when we do that, we can make this work. Humus is better for the earth and it is the strongest environmental influencing material in existence. It truly is amazing. Give you a story on this in the bottom of the photo. I should probably stop and confirm. You can see this bottom two plants. Yes. Thank you. And I, I want to talk about this. This is an Agus calientis. Agro Ag, you can see it on the pickup there, is based out of Agi, Agus calientis, the state of Mexico. We're down a little north, not much, from Mexico City, but mostly west in a small state. This guy has... 30,000 cows, if I'm remembering correctly, and 35,000 acres of land that they farm. The owner came up and attended a compost class here in Tampico, Illinois. Snuck a small bag, if we give everybody a humus bag, humus compost bag, it's not even a quart, I'm sorry, not even a pint, it may be a cup or a cup and a half of material. Took it back home. And if you notice, can you guys see the mouse wiggling over here in the photo? Mm -hmm. So if you look out through that chain link fence, that's actually a silage cornfield. And it's not easily seen out there, but some of it's literally actually now chopped. And then in the background, they still have a little more to go. But anyhow, my point just is, well, actually, yeah, it may be further up. But my point is, he went out in that field where he was growing corn. And this was on the 12th of July. If you really look close, you'd have to you'd have to have some good eyes. But that does say the 12th of July, which in Spanish is July. He went out there and took these two cups, equal amounts of soil scooped out of that cornfield out there, brought them in. On the right, he put about a quarter of an inch of our humus compost on top, and then watered both. Made some holes in the bottom and watered both. Did not tell his people that he did this. He kind of had it at his own home place. So his brother and two other men were, are his three agronomists for the farm. I mean, I'm talking about, I can't recall if it was four or 500 employees on this operation. It's a lot of people. And he has three agronomists and they're all scoffing at him to go to a compost class in America and think that he can come up with something better than what they've got in conventional ag. And so they were scoffing at him and they they kind of grilled us. And when I got there and all of that, they didn't know about these plants. And we I went, answered their questions. We probably talked an hour and a half or two, not quite two hours. And then he said, I got something to show you. He said, well, I wanted you to come out. And he had them in his truck cab. He brought them out, set them on his tailgate. And he said, okay, on the right is the material I brought back from Illinois, a little bit on top. Both soils are out there in that field. And now all three agronomists are pummeling me like crazy. Me and my son, Travis, went. And they're asking me, okay, so what's in it? How much NP and K? And I says, it's about 10 to... 20 pounds of nitrogen, phosphorus, and potassium. Wait a minute, what else is in it? Do you have other biostimulants in it? I said, yes, we do. And they looked at me expecting, you know, a label. I says, look, we make a humus protein out of the compost process. And then I went through exactly what I told you, that we capture more sun energy. If you stop and think about it, this is literally borrowing from last year's corn I'm sorry, not just corn because it came from us, but this is borrowing sun energy in a 
not a pill in a small little bag. This is just last year's sun energy and the previous years. If you do this five years in a row, there's an accumulated benefit that's pretty powerful. I might have a slide or two I'll show you after a while. So hemifying microbes are key. And as we look at the greatest benefit of each application of humus, proteins continue to buy impact for literally years. If you can look at a customer that's done this for five years running, it's a net accumulated value. It's so interesting. Your need for fertilizer purchases goes completely away in some cases to 70 to 90% reduction in other cases. It is just amazing what you can do. But see, we're not only getting benefit from last year, but we're getting benefits all the way back to 2018 this coming year <clears throat> because we've been on it this long. And it is amazing what this all will do. I'm going to talk a little bit about how liquid humus extract works. I'd like to just so it conditions and loses compacted soil. I can send you some of these slides so that you can take time to read them. The efficiency of other nutrients that you're adding. It stimulates photosynthesis and then it creates uh, the biodiversity and symbiotic relationship in the root zone. Again, be happy to send those slides. The important information is it's not a fertilizer. It improves soil tilt and moisture control. It optimizes your nutrients and it also naturally improves your plant health and yields. And over there in the center, reduced soil compaction, plant root stimulation, I can go through every one of those. Less reliance on fertilizer, lower input costs. But until you truly experience it yourself, that list doesn't really impact you. Trust me, I've been around the block a time or two. It's, it's more like everybody's from Missouri, show me, right? But it's still, this is the case. This is still the, the fact remains. This is what we experience. All right, let's continue. I'd like to talk about this a little bit. This actually is Penn Valley Farms. They're a humus center. This farm is looking at a scenario. This is very heavy, naturally red, sticky clay soils. And they were putting on regular compost for 16 years. They started in 1994, and I got them started making humus in 2010. That's 16 years. Now, I want to give you a little bit more background. Backing up about five years earlier, in 2005, see, this guy bought a turner from us in 1994. He was not our first customers, but he might have been between the 10th and 20th customer since we started manufacturing these things in 93. And he was making regular compost, pretty reasonable, good quality. It looked good, smelled good, but it wasn't humus. It was just regular compost. Didn't know about capturing sun photosynthate material as it stuff rots. And he's been putting on approximately two to three ton a year, every year for 16 years. In 2010, I was out in the field. And in this field, I was able to walk out there. They had a two or three tenths of an of rain just the night before. And it was interesting. My shoes got sticky. I probably had an inch to inch and a half of soil clinging around my shoes. It was like slippery snowshoes, or not really snowshoes, but it was just, I was concerned I was going to sit down suddenly, you know? And it was very st sticky, and I said, man, your soil st structure here is just not very good. And they looked at me and said, yeah, but you got to realize, we're in Pennsylvania, and this is red, sticky clay soil. I said, well, I understand what you're saying, but I'm surprised for 16 years worth of compost, that you haven't gotten better soil structure. And they kind of passed it off, but I didn't, I never forgot that. And I said to myself, well, they don't think they are getting this, but they're bought into making the EMS, so let's see how this works. 
2012, one day it rained eight and a half inches. This is within 150 feet of where I was slipping and sliding around that very same field the day after the eight and a half inches of rain. This field had been using comp regular compost for 16 years to 2010, two years earlier. It was tough clay soil that was always sticky when it rained. This is six inches deep, guys. It looks like granulated sugar. Yeah. We don't have a problem with soil structure once we start using humus compost. I'm just telling you that. Improve soil structure, less erosion, better yields, increase in crop quality, less crusting, reduce weeds. I, I just can't overemphasize the fact that this is actually also based in Lancaster County, Pennsylvania. And don't know if you know about that county, but that county has got more manure per acre than most people have. It's been said that there's enough manure to spread on every acre of the entire county an inch thick. There's exporting of manures in that county. And so, yeah, they've got plenty, but he still has people lining up for his product. Even though these same farmers have plenty of manure, they're buying his product for 220 bucks a ton. So, manure is not humus. Compost is not humus. Worm castings are not humus. Humates are not humus. Humic acids are not humus. And humus does not just happen. Let me get you back in, in my mind. I want you to think about what I said earlier. We are going to make sure that it's clear to you that humus is last year's sun energy recaptured and not allowed to evaporate. Bottom line, we're capturing last year's sun energy. It's a big deal. I remember one time we were in St. Louis, and I'm going through this one big tourist area, and I come up to these signs. I can't believe I saw this. And I had somebody take photos, and I just wish they'd have taken it a little bit better angles. Humus is a stable, long-lasting product of soil chemistry. This is about... 15 years ago, maybe not quite. Yeah, it would be about 15 years ago. And I had somebody with me. In fact, it was a person from that's our dealer from Australia. Says, please take a photo of these. And here's another one that they had. And it was just interesting that they were talking about some of this stuff. And now look at this. I don't know if you guys know what glomalin is. So maybe I should stop and ask. Do you know what glomalin is? I don't know. Okay, so it is the uh, byproduct of a fungus that builds a glue that's called glomalin. It was discovered by Dr. White. You can Google this word, glomalin. Glomalin is a beneficial fungus that grows on plant roots. It's also part of the mycorrhizal fungi, but it is a different portion of it. The glue comes off of the fungus, is deposited on soil particles, creating a structure, aggregate structure. Remember the structured soil that it had? Uh, just a few back here, right here. Yeah. Remember this? That's got glomalin in it. It's a protein. And what's interesting is that protein is the first cousin's very much structured like that glomalin is right here. It is part of the arbiscular mycorrhizal fungi. And the glue is named glomalin after glomalize, the taxonomic normal order of this group of fungi. So it, we have had this great, this is an organic field, by the way. You have a few weeds. Look at the end rows. There's, that's not all nice. But it's essentially a clean, economically weed-free field, okay? Not weed-free totally, but economically weed-free. Here's an example of eight ton of humus compost versus eight ton of raw manure. Again, I, I do this side by side, not because I think it's economic. We have a lot of customers that use 500, 1,000, 1,500, or a ton of humus compost. Um, probably our average in the Midwest in low value crops compared to what you have, we're probably running right around 1,000 pounds average. But if you notice in the insect down here, 
that's got the same cultivation as this grassy, weedy raw manure applied area over here. It's amazing the difference. Got a pretty neat story here. <clears throat> Only using liquid humus extract. You were talking about having extract. That's why I thought of this presentation. Notice what's going on beyond the fence out there. That's Canadian thistle and panoramic uh, pigweed. Pomeranic pig, pigweed. All right. Seven years later, no chemicals. That same area. Look at it. Guys, how did we do it? We put on liquid humus extract behind every cutting. We told him that he could not do anything different than between 25 and 32 days during the growing season. He has to cut it, whether it, it, it was grazed or not, whether it was cut or not, it needs to be in that range. So every he grazed this. Every time behind the grazing, there's anywhere from 10 to 20% of your stuff the cows don't quite mash down or eat. And uh, I said, well, you got to go out there and mow it. He says, well, there's nothing there to mow hardly. I says, I know. But the problem is, is all of those tall things keep the stuff around it out to six inches around each tall blade from doing its potential. You got to go back and cut it at about five inches. And so he did. He just religiously followed that. And now look at it. It didn't need a chemical to get rid of weeds, okay? Take a different example. Again, this is extract versus control. More whites in the center of this corn stalk on the right where the control was, not as far as the sen senescus uh, on the left. Same exact uh, field, looking at the leaves on the left, the bottom is a treatment. The top is the control. Look how much wider. On the right side of the leaf, it's lined up. You can't see it, but it is. I was involved in that. On the left, the bottom leaf extends. Control. On the left, you can see the leaves resting. I'm sorry. Uh, uh, looking at the, uh, the washboard ripples, as yeah. well as those, those leaves are tired looking. There's a lot more disease involved. If you notice some of these spots coming up, this is really going to look not nasty once it's almost the harvest. But these leaves over here are happier than all get out. This is what I'm talking about. But we're extracting humus protein now, guys. We're not so concerned about what microbe package I am extracting as it is I'm extracting protein. Why? Because the root tips will guide the, the balance between Fungal and bacteria once it hits the soil. I want to talk about that more later. Again, control on the left, extract on the right. You'll notice a whole lot more gamosis over here. Notice how much whiter this is. <clears throat> the other thing is the cottony material in the center is used up. Uh, plant senescence used up to produce the kernel of corn. Same age, right side by side, we don't, didn't have to borrow from the pantry. It's still actually going well from the roots. This plant, all plants, are programmed so that they will fill and finish. They will mature. Maybe a short crop, but they're going to mature. They'll take from their own stocks to do that. There's a lot. Yeah. Just look at the efficiency difference. It's amazing. Anyway, if you think about that year after year, and there's a neat story about this whole thing. All of these, all of this is the same field. Every bit of these is all together in the same field. This guy had a 24 row planter, 12 rows with the extract, 12 rows without. 30 gallon per acre of nitrogen and no extract. 15 gallon per acre of nitrogen and 15 gallon of extract, okay? Same amount of gallons applied, 12 rows of this, 12 rows of the, the uh, treatment. We went into the field that summer, and of course I'm walking in this field when these photos were taken. And I says, Larry was the farm manager of a very large farm, comparatively large farm, I should say, 
for Lancaster County is over, uh, I guess, 7,000 acres and about 3,000 cows and 6 million poultry hens. And I says, how's it going? And he says, fine. He says, what's our plot look like? And I would like to say this, this is about a 70 acre field. And so every pass had a control and a treatment all the way through the field. And so he says, well, he says, as far as your stuff goes, he says, there's not a nickel's worth of difference. So we went in there and I immediately picked this out. And he says, well, that's an anomaly. I'm not sure. I think you just want to make it look good. I just smiled. I pointed out the fact if you look very, very closely, there's still just a tiny amount of ripples, but not very much. And I pointed this out. I says, this is very, very pronounced. Oh, he wasn't even looking at that. And so then we went to the next pass, the, the next uh, 12, uh, 24 rows. And he didn't say much. And we went to the third one. And it took the sixth pass before he finally says, well, I guess you got a point. He kind of grudgingly said, I guess you got a point. I can still hear him say this. Anyway, it was just interesting that we had that different uh, field, different year. This is now back on Penn Valley. I'm sorry, not Penn Valley, but on another customer where they had some cover crops, extract on the right, none on the left. This is a different experiment. This is Penn Valley's um the what used to be the owner of Penn Valley, his brother's operation in Georgia. Now the guy passed on that was in Penn Valley, his son, who had been a protege of mine, I had forgotten to, sh to share that with you. For four years, three and a half years, he was a protege, an intern from about 2006 to 2010 and went home then to produce humus there. Well, his uncle down in Georgia, this is what this is about. His uncle down in Georgia, what you see right here is a couple of trials. If you see this, you can tell on August 9, they had a bad drought. This is commercial fertilizer, 160 foot strip of using liquid humus extract, another 160 foot strip of, of using fertilizer, and then the remaining field on the right, all being with extract instead of this commercial fertilizer in this severe drought. Just thought I'd point that one out. This happens to be this garden water pattern. I want you to take a good look at this because you're going to see this in a moment at a different angle coming at it from here, looking this direction. Here's a sprinkler. You see that sprinkler standing up? So you can tell that this is a circular pattern of watering this. But... He also had an injection system to put humus extract with his water. <clears throat> and I don't have a picture of that injection system. I can show it to you if you have any questions about it afterwards. However, what I want you to see is this. This is pretty phenomenal. He's going along that garden patch right outside of it. Can you guys see this video? Yeah. Yep. All right. He's got a penetrometer. He's going down through and it's going into the soil. Pretty reasonable. Would you agree? Oh, yeah. Now he's, now he's going out. This is actually in October and he can't get very well in there. He's had quite a bit of rain since August. Uh, quite phenomenal. And then he's just, he's just showing you that it's just pretty much hard compacted. So he's now going to go back. He's going to say, all right, let's, let's do this. Um, and then he's going to just try it again, just to show you. So he's just going to go forward, doing this one more time, just to show you it's a slightly different area. And so now he's kicking it in here. And, and I say different, it's a much different time. I should have brought that up. This was actually the October a year later kind of a thing okay look at that do you guys see that his feet came off the ground and it just falls in and this is like a year later he did it three times so he did it three different times had the same experience but you watch the first one and the second one there's a video patched together of the two different years and again that did pretty reasonable that's not too bad but you saw it earlier it's just totally amazing how much harder that is, okay? Every 
seven to 10 days, he had this injector system. Again, if you're interested in it, you can tell me, but uh, he put on 10 gallon per acre rate in this uh, garden patch as such. Talk about loosening soils. That's pretty much the proof of it. Back to Penn Valley, this hay test is at 293 RFV. The average is around 160. There's times and years where it's 120 to 140, and there's other years where it averages closer to 200, but never has there been this high of a quality of hay there in that county. This happens to be some more test results of his neighbors. Uh, this is on corn silage. You look at the starch levels, you look at the acetic acid down below, it's less, which is what we were looking for. The lactic acid is uh, higher. We were looking for that. Interestingly enough, the crude protein is lower. And at first I was concerned about that until I went on further and now look at the lignin. That is statistically phenomenal. As well as the digestibility is 3% higher and the fat in, in essence is also significantly higher, which is made, making that much preferred. Notice the photos up on this. This is where he didn't have the extract and over here is this, see this color difference. And so that's also in April 9th. This is now uh, November 23rd last year. Uh, and I apologize, I don't have the sound attached to it, but uh, you can see that his cows and calves are doing quite well. This is with weeds, and this is, or do you want healthy soils? That, you know, this, this stuff here is ready to mow. Land and soil become a medium that produces because of the commodities, fertilizers, chemicals, and waters that are sifted through it. But it can become a sustainable solid asset that because of humus protein science, which compounds the effect of what is invested, then you can take that expense and make something out of it because expense is a reality. Moving from an expense of cost to an expense of investment is your choice. And I like to just finish this slide with this very simple thing and that is this. Sometimes we need to step out of the woods so we can see the trees and see where you're going. You guys probably have all seen that in the past as well. And so, yeah, that kind of concludes this presentation as such. If you don't mind, uh, just a moment here, and I'll go ahead and 